1967, Montreal hosted The Greatest Show on Earth. A billion-dollar spectacle to celebrate the country's centenary of confederation. Expo 67, The Greatest Show on Earth. On a man-made site in the middle of the St. Lawrence River, an estimated 50 million will have visited the largest World Fair ever. People from across the world, even the Queen of England, travel to the French-Canadian city to catch a glimpse of the different pavilions, each with their own vision of what the future might hold. In the vastness of it all, the giants face each other, the Russian pavilion, the cross the river from the Dome of America. There was the American pavilion, a huge geodesic dome designed by Buckminster Fuller, the Bell Telephone Pavilion, where visitors could try out the Picture Phone, a newfangled device that let you see the person you were calling. And then there was a building called Habitat 67, the future of urban housing. Will we all be living in places like Habitat, where precast concrete blocks appear to balance crazily, just to make sure everyone has a room with a view? Habitat was a precarious, intricate system of building blocks stacked in just such a way that each unit would get its own garden, its own suburban-style pocket of fresh air and nature. Habitat was designed by a young Israeli-Canadian architect named Moshe Softy. In fact, it had been his thesis project when he was still at McGill University. And it was Softy's thesis advisor who picked the expo lineup, including Habitat. But while Habitat 67's crazy concrete blocks intrigued the public, the project also kicked up its fair share of controversy. So what happened? Softy's thesis project had put forth a plan where all the apartments would be made in a factory and assembled on site. And it wasn't a new idea exactly. Henry Ford had revolutionized the auto industry with assembly lines. So in theory, making building parts in a factory just like making cars in a factory, should mean big cost and time savings, too. But Softy's plans soon came up against some cold, hard realities. The original construction contract was for $10 million. But the whole thing ended up costing more than twice that amount. And while there were many reasons things didn't go as planned, for Softy, the main reason came down to the material. Concrete was chosen for Habitat because it was strong and fireproof. But it was also heavy. Each unit weighed about 80 tons, which required the building team to purchase expensive, heavy-duty cranes. Writing in 1967, Softy himself admitted, quote, the ideal material is yet to be developed. In other words, the project was just too ahead of its time. But today, Building materials and other manufacturing advances are finally ready to change the way we build our cities. Welcome to City of the Future, a podcast from Sidewalk Labs. Each episode, we explore the ideas and innovations that could transform cities. We are your hosts. I'm Eric Jaffe. And I'm Vanessa Quirk. In this episode, we're exploring an idea that will finally allow our buildings to catch up to the grand visions of the past. Factory-based construction. Habitat 67 is a very impactful uh, project, but it also followed a very problematic approach that architects consistently use, which is that instead of looking at the material culture and the supply chains, logistics, we tend to reimagine things as if a new industry will automatically appear and support our ideas. That's Ivan Rupnik. He's an architect and professor at Northeastern University who spent a lot of time researching and writing about the history of factory-based construction, sometimes called off-site construction. And when it comes to that history, most architecture buffs think of the 20s and 30s to the Bauhaus movement in Europe. But Ivan told us that those European architects were inspired by even earlier projects in the U.S. Like Walter Gropius literally brought those magazine articles in German on American precedents back to the U.S. So even the quote-unquote Bauhaus, quote-unquote avant-garde architects were really interested in a much more incremental change to the building culture, and we didn't have the sensibility to understand it. So despite America having some of the earliest examples of prefabricated construction, we just didn't have the sensibility, the willingness, to make a whole building culture around it. But Europe did. And once we got to the Cold War era, well, that didn't sit well with the U.S. anymore. The CIA was actually spying on the Soviet Union because there was 
so many units built in Moscow, there was a belief that those numbers couldn't be true. Huh. There was just a real embarrassment on the side of the U.S. that despite a fairly large growth, obviously in the suburbs of the U.S. in the 40s and 50s, that the Soviet Union was just, and, and other countries too, was just beating the pants off of the U.S. in terms of housing production. Good or bad, high quality or not, but just on a purely numbers game. It's almost like housing was another sort of arms race. Exactly. So the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development HUD, came up with a plan to beat the Soviets at their own prefab game. They called it Operation Breakthrough. The idea was to build units really as demonstrations, so not necessarily that would prove that the system was entirely optimal, but that they would at least introduce these systems into the kind of ecology. New technologies and new construction systems would sort of be forced onto what were seen to be unwilling builders or contractors. So did these unwilling builders and contractors take up these new fabrication technologies? Yeah. How did that go? It's literally officially been called a failure by Congress. Oh, geez. Yeah, there's a very interesting congressional report where it just huh. sort of lambasts the program. What happened? The energy crisis? Shipping big chunks of concrete around when you have an energy crisis was a problem, and it certainly impacted Operation Breakthrough, as did many other factors. Hmm. One of those factors? Politics. Certain members of Congress were looking for an excuse to say that government should not be involved in housing. Uh, right. Congress went very far and said, we're not going to do research anymore in housing. We're not going to do demonstration projects, public or not. Every, every, this, is, this just proves we, need, we shouldn't be involved in this at all. But they did have to admit that Operation Breakthrough wasn't all bad. It forced them to pass building regulations that streamlined the construction industry. HUD developed a code, a specific code, for what we colloquially call the trailer home, but is actually also officially called the HUD code home. And within two years, you have a new program which takes advantage of those regulations and it was able to provide truly affordable housing. Whatever we think about the quality of that housing, it's probably one of the most successful federal housing programs and certainly off-site housing programs in the world. And it's not just housing that's seen success with factory-based construction. Since Operation Breakthrough, a lot of hotels and hospitals have also been built this way. All the successes of the modular industry currently in the U.S. can strangely be linked to a number of regulations that were developed in order to support Operation Breakthrough. Hmm. So a seeming failure creates a framework that is quite successful. Does that mean Operation Breakthrough was successful? I don't know, but there would not have been that framework otherwise. But according to Ivan, regulation isn't the only path towards creating a framework for success for factory-based construction. It's more about changing the building culture itself. At this point, I mean, after maybe 10 or 15 years of looking at this stuff, I'm pretty confident that if we want to be serious about it, we need to work on lifting up the building culture as a whole. Otherwise, we're not going to see a change in mass housing. We're going to see some great examples. Some of them might be viable, some of them won't. We're going to see a lot of happen at 67s, but we won't see uh, the kind of shift that we really need. So how do we lift up the building culture? How do we convince the players the architects, the developers, everyone in the building ecosystem, that it's time to take a risk on factory-based construction? Yeah. How do we jumpstart this industry? Change is hard, right? Everybody in the ecosystem has to take a step in the same direction to make it work. That's Kareem Khalifa, the director of product design for buildings at Sidewalk Labs. You may remember Kareem from season one of City of the Future, where he helped us realize the potential of mass timber, which has a much lower carbon footprint than concrete or steel. Mass timber is the material of the future. The reason you go to mass timber is really for sustainability, but when you combine it with the factory, you get a speed and quality. According to Kareem, these three benefits, quality, speed, and sustainability, could really convince the building industry as a whole to buy in to factory-based construction. And getting to these benefits starts with changing the design process itself. If you think of how architects work today, they will buy a window from a catalog or a door from a catalog. So why does everybody have to design a floor plate from scratch? Why can't they pick a floor plate from a catalog? To help standardize the design process, Kareem and his team are developing what they call an architectural kit of parts. 
It's just four building parts, but like different Lego pieces, they can be combined in countless ways. The idea is that these four kit of parts could create an infinite number of different mass timber buildings. That's Lily Huang, an architect who works on the buildings team. We asked her to break down the kit of parts for us. There are four basic elements that form our kit, and they are facade panels. So that's everything that wraps around the exterior of the building, including windows, doors, and everything that's part of that envelope. And then the next part is the floor cassettes, which encompasses the floor of one unit, but the ceiling above. So it's really that sandwich that is in between a unit. It includes fire safety, such as sprinklers. It'll include mechanical, so the HVAC and ducts. And then it'll include the acoustic layer to protect the sound from traveling. Okay, so we have facade panels and floor cassettes. What's the third element? The third element is the structural components. So that's columns and beams. And these are the elements that hold up the building. And the last element is our interior partition modular walls. Okay, so keeping in mind that the potential benefits here are quality, speed, and sustainability, let's start with the quality. So, Lily, how does the kit of parts allow you as an architect to make a really high quality building, you know, one that doesn't feel cookie cutter? Yeah, you'd think of only having four parts would result in boring buildings, but it's actually the opposite. Having the kit takes away the boring aspect of the design and lets the architect focus on the more creative parts. We want to leave some creativity for like a sense of place and how an architect might want a space to feel to a community or to a neighborhood. And look, just to be clear, our kit of parts is not going to make a Frank Gehry building, (laughs) right? He will have stretched and broken our, our parts. But there aren't that many Frank Gehry buildings out there either. (laughs) And so most of us are trying to build really nice buildings um, that really perform well and that have some character. And we think we can fit that mold. We can actually offer really good building materials and building components that are assembled to people who normally wouldn't be able to afford them. We actually studied which real-world buildings we'd be able to make with our kit of parts, and we found that we could make 90% of the buildings in New York City. So with four parts, you can really create a huge variety of building types. And what about speed? How does the kit of parts help with that? Yeah, so by using the kit of parts, we can develop factory process lines that with their precision machinery are able to shape pieces of mass timber at a very high production rate. Yeah, mass timber is significantly lighter than concrete and steel and therefore simpler and more cost-effective to transport as well as assemble with one or two people per part. Our kit of parts is similar to Legos. Each of the Lego blocks has little dots on the top and it actually has a recess in the bottom. So when they come to our, your construction site, you can actually fit them together because they've been designed that way. So the pieces are designed for machines and factory workers to produce super fast, and they're shipped to construction workers who are trained to put them together almost as quickly as Legos. And it's also important to note that because the pieces have been cut so precisely with these machines, they come together like perfect puzzle pieces, which isn't just important for speed of assembly, but actually for sustainability, because airtight buildings require less energy to heat and cool. Mm, That's a really good point, Lily, actually. So let's get deeper into that sustainability piece. Uh, What are the other ways that factory-based construction offers sustainability gains? I mean, off the bat, I, I could imagine that this process must be less wasteful, right? Since we know exactly how much material we need from the very start, and we can make exactly that amount, nothing more. Yeah, and we would also have a bill of materials. So each part would have X amount of wood, glass, fasteners, insulation. And with that, we would know the carbon footprint of each of these components and of the whole building before we've assembled it. So when you assemble the whole building, you get the list of kit of parts, you get the price of all of your parts, and you get the sustainability factor uh, readout as well. 
So in today's world, that's really not, you're not able to do that. You keep selecting materials and asking for data about its sustainability. Mm. And some materials have it and some don't. But because we, we're going to do this over and over again, we can now ask for the people that are supplying those materials to a, provide us the sustainability of that material. And with mass timber as the building material, Kareem and Lily think we could take this idea even further. You could track not only the carbon emissions of a piece of timber, but even how sustainably it was harvested. And you could press the industry to keep improving. Recognizing that buildings are about 40% of carbon emissions. You know, I think the way that we build now has to radically change if we're going to address that. If we really want to address the climate change problem in the way that we need to in the next, you know, five and ten years, we really need to kind of change up the design process. And the answer to that, I think, is mass timber. And it's this piece of the puzzle, the fact that mass timber is not just light and strong, but better for our planet, that might just be the most important piece of all. Manufactured buildings are a great opportunity to get efficient buildings built But when you combine it with mass timber, which is a super sustainable material, you're ending up with the better building and doing something that's better for the environment all at once. And Cream isn't the only one who's bought into this idea. In fact, in the Pacific Northwest, a movement of factory-constructed mass timber buildings is already gaining momentum. So if I had to look forward to a city of the future, it would be a city that you could grow out of seeds in the palm of your hand. That's Susan Jones, the founding architect of Atelier Jones and the author of a book all about mass timber. In 2015, Susan had the opportunity to build her dream house in her hometown of Seattle. So I really wanted to do something experimental that we would be able to just bust out the doors and just say, This can inspire potentially new, sustainable, lower carbon technologies that will, who knows, maybe even change construction in in the U.S. And that was our sort of modest goal. But really, we wanted to build an experiment for ourselves. And I'm happy to report that actually my family really likes the house. (laughs) And we're still here. (laughs) Very important. Very important detail. Um, So what was the process like designing for a prefab home? I'll be honest, Vanessa. I felt really powerful as an architect. Mm. It was exciting to me because how many times have we been in design meetings as architects for again and again and had the contractor will say, you want to design that? Oh, that's just way too expensive. And you, we can't do that. No, we can't do that. No, we can't do this. And, you know, I respect that. It's a collaborative process and everybody's risking a lot and the owner's risking a lot and the contractor's risking a lot and they're guaranteeing pricing, etc. But this is something that was really exciting because as the owner, I could say, these are the panels I need. I could have them designed the way I wanted to. And then actually nobody could change it in the field because it was already mm. built. And so that kind of changed the balance of the designer being in charge of the project rather than the other way around. I so wasn't expecting you to use the word powerful. I totally stand by that. These panels are kind of boring and I'll even say the word ugly. I mean, there's, they're awkward. Let's just say that. And it's your job to sculpt space and to make intersections and re- repetitions and buildings out of these that really reinvent the way we work with materiality. I, I, I just, I feel like there's a tremendous amount of freedom. So for somebody who's not a designer, what are some of the benefits of building a home this way? First, the obvious one that's been talked a lot about if with mass timber is the schedule. You know, hey, all these panels arrive on the site. You can put them up really quickly. If they're repetitive panels, they might go up in four days for a a small three-story building. Our house took about two weeks, frankly, because I had the great uh, sense to start this process of putting the panels up in the middle of winter, which was really not a good Mm. idea in the blustery Pacific Northwest. But, you know, you learn from your mistakes in those areas. (laughs) And so that can accelerate it that process of design much faster. We can get onto the site faster. We don't have to wait. And that's a really exciting thing. And that's going to lower cost. That is exciting. That's really compelling. Exactly. And it's even more powerful when you say, okay, great. So I can shave two months off this schedule. 
wow, okay, well, that's cool. And it's going to save the time of the labor crews on site and, you know, all those savings that go along with that, that extra two months. But now take it back even one step further and bring it into the developer's pro forma. What happens when she can get tenants in there? What happens when she can start getting rent payments faster and add that to her equity payoffs, bank loans, et cetera? That's where you get the real value over time. And that really starts to add up. I've now taken three contractors through this process and it's always worked out. So I do think we are at this real interesting tipping point. Part of the reason that we're at this historic tipping point? In 2019, a revolutionary change to international building code opened the door for more tall timber buildings everywhere. And Susan was on the committee that helped make it happen. I had the the privilege or or the bane or the responsibility or whatever it was, but I was asked to sit on that committee for almost three years pro bono work. And it really, when those codes came out and you saw the green lights being pushed on every corner of this country of projects, of developers that have been waiting for this, and all of a sudden projects are springing up. And these are tall timber buildings. This is under, either in design or in construction. And, and I don't know these architects. It used to be I, I knew every single architect who was in this space and called them up and commiserated. And there was this really strong community, and there still is, but it's definitely broadened. And that's exciting. I mean, both of our kids are really interested in policy now, which after that code experience, mm. I, I don't think they would ever would have had that. But mm. they got to see firsthand the impact of a small gesture done by really one family turn into this large, broad movement that ended up changing codes to build high rises in cities that we'll never maybe even see. That's what's motivating me is to look at my children's eyes, my grandchildren's eyes, some 60 years later and say, or maybe not in my case, but a few years later and say, dude, I tried my heart to change our construction industry. And I spent a hell of a lot of time doing that. I love the design and I do love the prefabricated qualities. And I love the idea of being a pioneer on the cutting edge, but I wouldn't do it if it wasn't replacing a material that is so dirty and is so carbon intensive and is so tied to our early 20th century mindsets of how we build in this country. Susan's not alone. Her entire profession is finally starting to not just design sustainably, but to connect to the broader building culture. And even more exciting, all the players in the building ecosystem are starting to think about how they could build butter too. And thanks to a new wave of innovations, including a building material that's strong and sustainable, a new approach to designing buildings with manufacturing in mind, and machinery that can speed up the jobs that construction workers do. Thanks to all these advances, factory-based construction is an idea that is finally ready to catch up to its promise. And take off in cities around the world. You're going to see that people are watching these sustainable buildings be creative and they'll start shifting the entire industry. And I think that is what is gonna let, allow people to lean in and make this type of change. Thank you for listening to City of the Future, a podcast from Sidewalk Labs. Your hosts are Vanessa Quirk and me, Eric Jaffe. We are produced by Benjamin Walker and Andrew Calloway. Mixed by Zach McNeese. Special thanks to Ivan Rupnik, Kareem Khalifa, Lily Huang, and Susan Jones. Our art is by the great Tim Cow. Our music is composed by Adam James Levine Arity. If you want to hear more of Adam's work, you can check out his band, Lost Amsterdam, at AmsterdamLost.com. To learn more about Sidewalk Labs, visit our website at SidewalkLabs.com, where you can subscribe to our newsletter at the bottom of the page. And you can also follow us on Instagram at City of the Future Pod. See you in the future. Bye.